Good afternoon. I'm happy to greet all the listeners on this meeting. My name is Nikita Stazonov. I am a philosopher. I teach at the Sreda Obuchenia and uh, I'm currently lecturing on the philosophy of art. Today we'll be moderating our meeting with Stephen Shaviro, a philosopher and a professor of English at the Wayne University in Detroit, US. Stephen works with such subjects as imagination, fantasy, post-human thinking, affectation and subjectivity. Stephen's works can be read in Russian, the books Outside of Criteria and Melancholy. Both were published in the Gide Press publishing house in the Russian translation and Melancholy is going out very soon in October. In this lecture, Stephen will be talking about the methodologies, strategies and stakes in science fiction writing, science fiction in general, imagination and future. Uh, after the lecture, we'll have 30 minutes for Q&A. Please write your questions in the broadcast chat. We will collect them, pick the most interesting questions to shape our discussion. The broadcast is running in both languages, so listeners can select whether they want to listen in the original or in translation. Uh, that's that from me, and I'm giving the floor to Stephen. Please begin your lecture. Hello, and I want to thank everybody who arranged this. It's a privilege to be able to talk like this, something which we couldn't do a few years ago and something which we can't do live because of obvious issues. What I want to talk about is some of my current work about science fiction. And what I'm really thinking about is how science fiction as a literary mode or genre can be used to think about future possibilities. So it'll, a lot of it will be general, though there will be some specific details. Okay, I'll start. What is science fiction about? One obvious answer is that it is about the future. This is not a matter of grammar. Most science fiction stories are narrated in the past or present tense, just like other sorts of written narratives. Nor it is, is it a matter of formal innovation. Most science fiction stories are straightforwardly representational or referential in the same way that traditional naturalistic fiction tends to be. As John Clute argues, science fiction is essentially a continuation of the mimetic novel. It's just that science fiction with its future orientation is mimetic of or refers to different sorts of things than other fictional prose narratives do. By saying that science fiction stories are representational or referential, I am going against the prevailing understanding of science fiction. The best known in the West, though he's from Croatia, critics of science fiction, Darko Suvin says that science fiction is the literature of cognitive estrangement. While I do not contest the importance of either cognition or estrangement in science fiction, I still insist that science fiction texts are representational ones in the sense that they display a fundamental aboutness. They have external content. They do not predominantly focus as high modernist works are often said to do upon the medium of their own craft so that the expression matters more than what is being expressed. It's a quote from the American art critic, Clement Greenberg. It is true that some brilliant new wave science fiction of the 1960s and 1970s emulates the self-conscious narrative strategies of 20th century, century modernist and avant-garde literature. But even the most explicitly experimental and for, formally audacious science fiction texts from this period nonetheless remain basically referential. Formal innovation still works in the service of an explicit external content. Even in these cases, science fiction writing has more in common with the figurative art of Jack Kirby than it does with the self-reflexive abstractions of Kirby's near contemporary Jackson Pollock. Uh, 
For the most part, science fiction narratives overtly claim to depict or illustrate a world that exists in its own right, beyond the limits of the text. This remains the case, even though the world so depicted diverges sharply from the one in which we live and indeed does not actually exist. Science fiction shares this quality of aboutness with other popular narrative genres. These genres are all predominantly referential, even if the actual events to which they refer do not really happen. Samuel Delaney explains the difference between science fiction and other sorts of referential fiction in terms of their diff different levels of subjunctivity. This again is not a matter of grammar, the actual use of verbs in the subjunctive mood, which is very rare in English, but rather of a discourse's overall level of possibility. As Delaney says, science fiction concerns events that have not happened, at least so far, and such events are very different from the fictional events that could have happened in naturalistic fiction or the fantastic events that could not have happened in fantasy writing. Delaney's observation can be restated in terms of the worlds in which fictional events take place. Naturalistic fiction places its imaginary characters and events in the context of something like the familiar world in which the writer and his readers actually live or in which their historical predecessors lived. On the other hand, non-naturalistic or fantastic genres depart from actual world as presumed context. They engage instead in building alternative worlds within which their characters live and the events they describe take place. These alternative worlds differ from the world we know in at least some respects though they usually retain enough features of actuality as to make them at least partly recognizable. Depending on the sort of fiction in question, these alternative worlds may involve counterfactual historical sequences, as well as entirely fantastic locales and physically impossible happenings. Science fiction differs from other fantastic genres in that the alternative world to which it refers is a future world when that post dates, extends beyond and departs from, but therefore to a certain extent also arises out of the actual world in which it is written. Okay, I'm gonna skip over some qualifications. There are different ways in which there are problems about even saying what science fiction is. There are always muddy cases, things which don't quite fit together, exceptions, border cases, and so on. I'll just skip over that. Um, I'm perfectly aware that genre designations like science fiction cannot be made rigorous and precise. It's always possible to find ambiguous cases, exceptions, and counterexamples. Um, and this also is a historical change. As John Reeder puts it, Frankenstein was not a science fiction novel when it was initially published in 1818 because science fiction didn't exist. But today it seems clear that it's one of the founding texts of science fiction. Science gen genre characteristics can't only refer to the text in and of itself, but also has to involve its external context, when it is written, who reads it, and how, and so on. Nonetheless, genre designations like science fiction can still be useful and valuable as long as we keep their limits in mind. It's very difficult to th speak about individual cultural artifacts without taking questions of things like genre into consideration. No cultural object is so unique that it doesn't in some sense belong to one genre or another and often to several at once. So that is sort of a reason why I'm using genre designations like science fiction, even though I realize there are weaknesses and exceptions and it's inexact. Genre designations, you might say, like science fiction, are abstractions of a certain kind. And we may say about them what Alfred North Whitehead says about abstractions more generally. You cannot think without abstractions. Accordingly, it is of the utmost importance to be vigilant in critically revising your modes of abstraction. That is to say, we have to use abstractions in order to get anywhere at all. But for this very reason, we always need to be vigilantly aware of the flaws and limitations of our abstractions. Okay, again, I'll skip over a little of that, but I'm just trying to signal that abstractions like a genre designation like science fiction are unavoidable, but we should always be aware that there's a certain vagueness or limitation attached. <clears throat> 
making allowances for all these qualifications, my basic argument is that science fiction is about futurity. I want to give this word a particular resonance, distinguishing it from any more general sense of the future. Just as naturalistic fiction recounts events that could happen in the world as it exists at the present moment, even though they are, have not actually happened. So science fiction recounts events that could only happen at some moment in the future, following on from what exists in the present. But science fiction does this without claiming that those events actually will happen. Science fiction envisions a futurity that never becomes present, never actually comes to pass. Far from claiming the, to predict the future, therefore science fiction vehemently rejects this ambition. In other words, what I'm here calling futurity is not the same as the actual future. Futurity is not something that will happen a minute or a week or a million years from now. Rather, futurity always re retains its subjunctivity. It is something that could happen, but it is never something that actually does happen. Futurity in its very nature is always unrealized and unfulfilled. In the phrase favored by the German Marxist philosopher Ernest Bloch, futurity is a perpetual not yet. It is vague and plural, a cluster of possibilities rather than a single determination. Futurity is therefore a kind of opening, an incipience, an inflection, a nuance, a latency, a tendency. It is not part of any actual situation but it is implicit in actual situations, even the ones that seem most closed and complete in themselves. I may well encounter wisps of futurity in the form of intimations, premonitions, and anticipations, but these are not just subjective fantasies, not just my own imaginative projections. Rather, futurity is always a hidden dimension of things themselves. Every actual situation already bristles with potentialities even if these potentialities never really come to pass. Science fiction works to discern these implicit potentialities. It is often said that science fiction is really about the present moment in which it is written rather than the future time in which it is set. I'm trying to suggest that these are not mutually exclusive alternatives. To say that science fiction is about futurity is to say that it envisions potentialities rather than actualities. But these potentialities do in fact exist today at the present moment. They are fully real in their own right. It is just that their existence does not take the form of actual states of affairs. Rather, these futurities exist precisely as potentialities or anticipations. They are not directly apprehensible, but we can sense them by their effects as they deform the present moment, pulling the current situation outside of and beyond itself. As Richard Grusin puts it, the possible futures envisioned by science fiction have real effects in the present, even before they have happened. Or in the words of Afrofuturist Rashida Phillips, the inventor of black quantum futurism, the future both near and far impacts the present now, reaching back to meet the past and create our experiences of the present. If the past still lingers in the present, then you may, we may say that futurity already haunts the present even before it arrives and even if it never does arrive. In order to draw out these penumbral futurities and make them more explicit, science fiction engages in thought experiments. This is more than just a vague analogy. Science fictional thought experiments, much like actual experiments in physical science, take place in closed artificial situations. An experimental setup can be described as a simplified model of the world the abstraction from experience of which Whitehead writes. Within such an artificial abstract situation, it becomes possible to isolate particular processes or tendencies. These are vectors pointing towards possible futures. As the philosopher Roy Boscar puts it in his account of the workings of physical science, an experiment may now be understood quite simply as an attempt to trigger or unleash a single kind of mechanism or process in relative isolation free from the interfering flux of the open world, so as to observe its detailed workings or record its characteristic mode of effect and or to test some hypotheses about it. The processes or tendencies discovered in the course of scientific experimentation are themselves objectively real features of the world, 
They are not just anthropocentric projections. But without the relative isolation and closure of an experimental setup, an artificial situation devised by scientists, we might not be able to notice these effects or pick them out, for they are easily masked and swamped by the interfering flux of the open world or by what systems theorists call noise. Science fiction narratives operate according to a similar dynamic. Much like scientific experiments, they are devised to be focused and limited in scope. A certain degree of artificial closure is required in order to work through specific tensions and pick out their implicit futurities. This limitation usually takes the form of more or less closed narratives. A science fiction story posits particular circumstances and processes that are focused through the experiences of particular characters. What might happen, for instance, if Porsche spiders, already arguably among the most intelligent invertebrates, had their intelligence boosted to human levels by genetic manip manipulation? This is addressed in Adrian Tchaikovsky's novel, Children of Time. Or how might New Yorkers adopt, adapt to the heightened sea levels and flooding of much of the city that are likely to result from global warming? This is addressed by Kim Stanley Robinson in his novel, um, New York 2212. Science fictional thought experiments are not quantifiable, of course, in the manner of actual experiments in physical science. But this is what allows science fictional experiments to be open and audacious and to include more noise and incoherence than strictly physical experiments are able to handle. Okay, I will skip over a little. Um, science fiction works explicitly and overtly with a high level of possible in incoherence. It de-emphasizes the taken for granted assumptions of the present moment in order to explore the changes, instabilities and transformations of futurity. The problem for every work of science fiction is to tolerate as much categorical incoherence as possible while at the same time sufficiently delineating the scope of a thought experiment and of the alternative world in which it takes place so that some sort of resolution is still attainable. In other words, the art of the thought experiment in science fiction, as the Belgian philosopher Isabel Stengers puts it, involves unfolding the consequences of a daring hypothesis. A strong initial supposition is necessary as well as both care and imagination, working it through and considering how lives might be changed by it. A successful science fiction narrative, Stenger says, engages in the exploration of effects. It envisions a future world that, here's a quote from Stenger's, is dense with the repercussions and consequences of its hypothesis. A world whose inhabitants live with the opportunities, problems, dilemmas, habits, hopes and fears the hypothesis makes possible, but does not explain. As science fiction works through these repercussions and consequences, it evokes and invokes futurity, but without ever making anything like actual predictions. That is to say, science fiction is non-deterministic. It is concerned with the range of outcomes that a new social or technological development makes possible, but without maintaining that the development in question can necessitate any outcome in particular. Okay, here I come to the title of my talk, which was Extrapolation, Speculation, and Fabulation. These are the three most common tools, I think, by which science fiction does its thought experiments. Um, so I'm going to talk about each of the three terms, extrapolation, speculation, and fabulation separately. Extrapolation most literally refers to mathematical modeling. modeling. We extrapolate what on a graph, we extend a straight line or continue the direction of a curve. Extrapolation is fundamentally probabilistic. It depends upon an assumption of continuity. Barring outside interference and disruptive feedback effects, we expect that a trend or process will continue to unfold in the same manner as it, are, as it has already done up to the present moment. Of course, we know that this is not an accurate assumption. Extrinsic factors intervene all the time so that disruptions can and do occur once we step outside of the artificial closure of the experimental situation. 
In addition, even in the absence of outside interference, many processes are varied or disrupted by their own feedback. We know all this from chaos and complexity theory. Um, the best science fiction at extrapolations are fully aware of this pitfall though. To extend particular events and tendencies, to accelerate and intensify them can also mean to follow them all the way to their singular limits. At such points or in such moments, they show qualitative changes and mutate into strange new forms. Extrapolation thus works to reveal the implicit and hidden potentialities of social and technological processes. For a good, good example of this, in the 1960s and 1970s, the British science fiction writer John Brunner published four dystopian science fiction novels, each of which isolated and extrapolated from a few particular social trends. Stand on Zanzibar deals with overpopulation. The Jagged Orbit deals with racism, hyper-individualism, and the proliferation of assault weapons. The Sheep Look Up deals with environmental pollution and degradation of the environment. And the Shockwave Writer with massive data collection with future shock. Brenner extrapolates these trends, all of which existed when he was writing in a number of ways. He shows how they are produced, promoted, and accelerated by powerful corporations and elites. He uses modernist prose techniques to convey the effects of media amplification and saturation. He traces the ways that technological changes are intertwined with social and cultural ones. And he narrates the mad proliferation of all these processes, how they give rise to grotesque and unintended, unintended consequences, and ultimately push society to the point of massive dysfunction and breakdown. Of course, Brunner did not predict the future with any sort of literal accuracy. The 21st century societies he depicts in these novels are quite different from the one that we actually live in today. And although he anticipates the massive growth and ubiquitous extent of computation and communication in the early 21st century, many of the details he provides to these technologies seem rather clunky and old fashioned. But even if Brunner got the details of the future wrong, he got the futurities right his novels envision prospects and potentialities that are still matters of deep concern for us today. These include poisoned oceans and mass extinction events, schizoid personality structures generated by and refracted through social media, resurgences of racism, weapons fetishism, and outbreaks of violence, and governmental and corporate surveillance invading all aspects of what used to be considered private life. Brunner exact extrapolates futurities that still menace us, if anything, more severely now than they did when the novels were written a half century ago. Brenner's future is not our actual present, but his anticipations are still our own. Okay, that's um, extrapolation. And second, speculation. Speculation has broader horizons. It implies a freer flight in the thin air of imaginative generalization, as Whitehead phrase from Whitehead, and a more concerted activity of proposing and testing what Stanger calls daring hypotheses, and a greater openness to risk and uncertainty. This means that extrapolation follow, picks up at the point where extrapolation falters and fails. If extrapolation follows a social or technological trend to the limits of its potential, then speculation seeks to imagine what happens when a trend goes beyond its potential, pushes against or beyond its own limits where extrapolation is grounded in probabilistic reasoning. Speculation is rather concerned with possibilities, no matter how extreme and improbable they may be. As Rod Serling once said in his introduction to an episode of The Twilight Zone in the 1960s, science fiction is the improbable made possible. The phrase speculative fiction is sometimes used in the English speaking world as a synonym for science fiction. At other times, it designates a superset that includes other fantastic genres. But in either case, it's difficult to disentangle fictional speculation from its two near doubles in the modern world, philosophical speculation on the one hand and financial speculation on the other hand. So let me talk about both of those. In the late 18th century, Kant's critical philosophy sought to put an end to metaphysical speculation. We fall into delusion and dogmatism, Kant says, when we try to go beyond the limits within which our formulations alone have meaning and relevance. For instance, even a statement that is true for every particular entity in the universe is not true for the universe itself, since the universe as a whole is not a particular entity. 
And the first half of the critique of pure reason Kant demonstrates that our knowledge pertains only to appearances, not to things themselves. And in the second half, he tracks down catalogs and refutes the various forms of speculative delusion that threaten to lead us astray. Kant tells us that we cannot ever truly know things as they actually are in themselves, apart from our impositions upon them. And he further emphasizes that we cannot ever hope to grasp the unity, totality, or comprehensive grounding of all existence. All these lie beyond the boundaries of any possible understanding. Even as Kant warns us against these errors, however, he also acknowledges that the drive to speculation can never be eliminated. It is a natural and unavoidable illusion intrinsic to reason itself. And indeed, ever since Kant, philosophers from the German idealists of the early 19th century to the speculative realists of today have again and again searched for loopholes that would allow them to overcome Kant's post the positing of limits and his restriction of knowledge to the empirical realm. But it's not easy to restore the rights of speculation. Just as any successful abstraction must pay the price of leaving certain details unaccounted for, so any speculative attempt to move beyond mere phenomena will find itself inevitably haunted by some sort of exclusion or remainder. But this falsity is not necessarily the end of the matter. After, um, and here I quote Whitehead, who who notoriously proclaims that it is more important that a proposition be interesting than that it be true. A proposition is false when it fails, whether by error or admission to describe the world as it actually is. But if the false proposition is interesting enough, it may stimulate thought, either making us aware of its own gaps and omissions, or else by suggesting potentials for difference, alternatives to what is actually the case. A good speculative proposition draws us down an unexpected path. It provides what Whitehead calls a lure for feeling. Without the speculative lure of false propositions, we might never be moved to change anything. Speculation attracts us and unsettles us, encouraging us to think and act in ways that we might not have done otherwise. In some, even though speculation does not lead us to higher truths, it works in a positive manner by taking the form of fiction. Its import is aesthetic rather than epistemological. Okay, I will skip over a little, I, I link this notion of speculation as aesthetic to some of the things that the speculative realist philosopher Graham Harmon talks about and to other and, and to other treatments about how H.P. Lovecraft's weird fiction as well as certain types of science fiction appeal to this. But I turn now to an example of fictional speculation and for this, I look at the Chinese science fiction writer Xi Xin Lu's trilogy, Remembrance of Earth's Past, consists of three novels. The series can be described as a first contact narrative. It tells the story of our encounter with an alien intelligent species from a planet in the Alpha Centauri triple star system. The aliens threaten to invade and conquer the Earth, but this action unfolds in slow motion because even though the aliens travel through space at 1% of the speed of light, which is far faster than our own technology is capable of doing. It'll take them 400 years to arrive since Alpha Centauri is four light years away from Earth. The trilogy shifts from a local immediate and historically grounded context, China during the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s, but from there it spirals relentlessly onwards and outwards. By the end of the third volume, we are projected millions of light years away from Earth and billions of years into the future until we, we approach the near extinction of the universe. It's from this almost final point of view that we are offered a remembrance of a past that for us is still futurity, but for the people in the novel is in their past. We look back respectively on the history of planet Earth. The novel's expansion in time and space also gives rise to a progressive widening of their speculative scope. Lu moves from local political considerations, China in the 1960s, to questions of galactic sociology, from actual existing technologies to presumptively far more powerful ones and from debates over military tactics and strategy to disquieting suggestions about the deep structure of the cosmos. The novels are grounded in physics as we currently understand it, but they move beyond their scientific premises to construct a vast speculative vision. There is no precise point at which we cross over from simply empirical considerations to the universal metaphysical questions that Kant declared unanswerable, but the narrative as a whole carries us by slow degrees 
all the way from the anger and resentment of one particular human scientist to a situation in which the fate of the earth and beyond that of the entire universe hangs in the balance. Lou's fickle, fictional speculations slide past the limits decreed by Kant without ever explicitly transgressing them. Okay, and this allows us to, again, see the kind of reality that is outside our empirical ken and that various speculative realist philosophers like Graham Harmon and Kenton Mayasu have written about. However, the question of futurity brings us back to the other half of speculation. If speculative philosophy is one, speculative finance is the other near double of speculative fiction. Economic activity always has a time dimension. It takes time to produce goods, to distribute them, and to consume them. Debts and obligations persist over long stretches of time as well. Any demand for an immediate clearing of debts would paralyze nearly all human activity. Societies were organized around extended durations with long-term exchanges and never completed reckonings long before the invention of money. But practices of specifically financial modes of speculation have steadily expanded over the course of the history of capitalism. Today, all economic activity, no matter how physically real or productive, is refracted through and largely governed by the abstract calculative mechanisms of financial speculation. The object of such speculation is always the future with its chances and its differences from the present. Indeed, financial speculation used to be known as futures trading. Today, such speculation takes a wide variety of forms, ranging from straightforward loans and insurance contracts, all the way to derivatives, credit default swaps, collateralized debt obligations, and other arcane financial instruments that caused a worldwide financial collapse in 2008. Speculative financial instruments are themselves fictions of a court of a sort, since their contingent claims referring to future events that may not ever come to, come to pass. In a certain sense, they in, instantiated trade in abstractions rather than physical commodities or into the future and expressed in the subjunctive mode, which is a quote from the science fiction critic Cheryl Vint. The monetary value of arcane financial instruments is fictional because it is most often based on entirely arbitrary presuppositions. It has almost nothing to do with the market value of the actual physical assets that ostensibly underlie these financial instruments. Nonetheless, the fictionality of financial instruments does not mean that they are unreal or ineffective. Indeed, they have powerful pragmatic effects as we saw across the world in 2008. Speculative fiction finance produces its fictions by pricing potential future events. Even if these prices are entirely arbitrary, their very existence works to bind the future to the present. Economists have largely insisted on the radical difference between risk and uncertainty. Risk involves probabilities among a closed set of outcomes. It therefore can be calculated rigorously through probabilistic mathematics. But uncertainty is fundamentally unpredictable since we do not even know what the alternatives are. In spite of this, financial markets repeatedly claim to transform <laughs> uncertainty into mere risk. Nearly any price will do. A fictional financial determination is better than no determination at all. Um, in other words, fact, financial speculation today really does a lot of what I was saying science fiction did a few minutes ago. It, use, it, it has a probabilistic logic or even a possibilistic logic, some scholars have said, which is more like what I said about speculation than extrapolation in, sci in science fiction. So speculative finance and speculative fiction remain intimately intertwined. They both deal with improbable possibilities. I would like to say that where science fiction seeks to multiply these possibilities and open up alternative futures, finance rather works to shut them down by accounting for them in advance and making them priceable in the present. But it may be that I'm being a little too self-congratulatory about the difference that science fiction opens up and finance closes down because the logics are so closely intertwined. And here I bring up, I'll, I'll say this very quickly, skip over a lot, but I'll, there's a short story called Overvalued by a science fiction writer, Mark, Sitin, Mark Stasenko. He imagines a future in which people are themselves the object of futures contracts. It is very expensive to go to university. 
the way you could get to university and pay the extreme tuition is by putting out your own future as a as a kind of financial offering. Companies or rich people will buy portions of your future in return for funding you in the present. If you sell these offerings, then they then what happens is that you give them, they sort of own part of you as like a stock in the stock market. They they pay for your college tuition. And then when you get a job later on, they get a the investors get a percentage of your earnings. So they're betting that you will earn enough money to make their their investment pay off. This turns out to be profitable. Again, I'm skip over a lot because I have a lot of the story in the original manuscript. Um, what happens basically is that um, you have a, a very big market of trading these things, but you have some cases where somebody disappoints. Their stock value goes down because their earnings seem to be very poor. What do you want to do in this case? A capitalist corporation wants to liquidate its investments. The way to liquidating its investments is to have a higher assassin to kill the person who's the object of the investment. So you sell short your stock in person X, and then you hire an assassin to kill person X, which makes their stock go to zero. And because you sold short, you're able to make a profit from it and get out of a, of a bad long-term situation. So this application of the financial logic of the futures market to actual human lives is at once outrageously far-fetched and, and, and yet at the same time, it's actually not much different from or not that far away from what actual futures trading actually does. <clears throat> and the story, so it's, it's a satirical story, but it's also a kind of warning showing that this kind of logic continues even, even though it seems horrific in the story, it's not that far from what actually happens. So it's a kind of warning or it's a kind of depiction of a potentiality that, 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 that could happen. And that is how speculation works. Okay, for the rest of the time, I wanna talk about the third mode I talked about, which is fabulation. Fabulation is a somewhat more rarefied term, less common in English than either extrapolation or speculation. It was first applied to science fiction in 1975 with the literary critic Robert Scholes, who saw fabulation as the main te technique of what he was beginning to see back then as postmodern fiction. And it meant fiction which was self-reflexive, which was metafictional, which referred back to itself, which claimed not to be actual, but to play with the very nature of representation and of language. Um, so this goes back to what I was saying before when I say that even though it may seem not to be true, there's that ultimate sense in which science fiction actually is representational because of its aboutness. So they're very, they're very much, there are a number of contradictions in the idea of fabulation. It's playing, it's making something that's self-consciously known to be false or impossible, and yet it's embedding this falseness or impossibility in the question of futurity and potentiality that I mentioned earlier. So, I'll skip over the science fictional history of skulls and critics in science fiction who use the term fabulation, but I would want to suggest that fabulation actually is a kind of realism in the sense that it refers to a reality that we cannot know literally, but only know through, again, what Alfred North Whitehead calls false propositions. That means that fabulation provides us with precisely the sort of incomplete, indirect, and distorted aboutness that is best suited to the depiction of reality that's beyond our grasp, and especially a reality in the future that we cannot actually have in the present. Okay, therefore, what we, another thing we can say about fabulation is often described by Scholes and others as the process of modeling, rather than trying to render the texture of life act naturalistically, the, these fictions sort of make a model, but this is what I've said already about both extrapolation and speculation as forms of thought experiments. Fabulation just takes what extrapolation and then speculation do and pushes them still further in order to create further degrees of dissonance. One way to understand this is by looking at the history of the phrase fabulation in French and English philosophy of the 20th century. The term seems to be introduced, as far as I can tell, into philosophy by Henri Bergson, who uses the term fabulation in French or fabulation in English in his finer major work, Two Sources of Morality and Religion. 
published towards the end of his life in the 1930s. Bergson's usage is then further elaborated by Gilles Deleuze in his second cinema volume, Cinema to the Time Image. And the science fiction critic James Burton cites it in his book about Bergson and Philip, the science fiction writer Philip K. Dick. Now, in English, this is actually obscured by strange translations. Fabulation in French becomes myth making in the translation of Bergson and storytelling in the translation of Deleuze. So, in both cases, they're, they're, those, those phrases, myth making and storytelling, are translating the French word fabulation. But fabulation is at this point has become familiar enough that it seems better to use the, the same French word in English as fabulation in order, in order rather than getting confused by these other types of translations. Bergson describes fabulation as a virtual instinct, which, indivi which influences both individual and collective human behavior by generating fictitious hallucinatory perceptions the purpose of it, psychologically for individuals, the purpose of these hallucinations is to provoke immediate pre-reflexive actions at moments when fear physical survival is at stake. Fabulations are self-consciously fictional in terms of their form and structure, but the makers of an audiences for these fabulations may not realize this. As Burton says, the science fiction critic Burton says, seeing a ghost is just as much a fabulation as telling a ghost story. One is psychological, one is elaborated narrative, but they're both sort of, again, false propositions that have powerful positive effects. On the social level, Bergson tells us that the never ending work of fabulating, of fabulation operates in a more elaborated and self-conscious way when it is a matter less of provoking instantaneous individual actions than of providing socially sanctioned background conditions and interpretive contexts for how we understand and interact with the world. We see this, Bergson says, in the institutions of religion and mythology in all human societies, as well as in the work of novelists and dramatists in the modern world. So both myths and religions and in the 20th secularized 20th century and onward, narrators and storytellers are engaged in acts of fabulation, which have these larger social effects. Bergson talks about the difference between static and open, static and dynamic forms, static forms sort of conform to a fixed order, whereas dynamic forms open the possibility of change and and difference. And in this case, we would science fiction would work as a kind of open form of fabulation. Um, Deleuze argues that in late modernity, aesthetic modes of fabulation break away from and become to a large degree independent of the more familiar closed institutional forms. This makes it possible to open the process of fabulation onto futurity. Deleuze finds in the politicized third cinema of the developing world of the 1960s and 70s, not the myth of a past people, but the storytelling or fabulation of the people to come. The people must be fabulated into existence through processes of revolutionary transformation. In the United States today, I think one finds similar thing in the literature, which has been called Afrofuturism, which is science fiction written by and directing at the concerns of African-Americans and of Black people around the world more generally. Afrofuturism often refers both to the past and to the future. <clears throat> the, one of the originators of Afrofuturism, the jazz musician Sun Ra, referred both to ancient Egyptian pyramids and to spaceships from the planet Saturn. In other words, he was invoking both myths of the past and a myth of his own creation of the future, directing them both against what was bad in the, the racism that was bad in the present. So this is a way that fabulation can be open and transformative rather than reinforcing social dogmas. James Burton, the science fiction writer, critic, describes Philip K. Dick's practice of fabulation as an evolved faculty for constructing and believing in fictions which have the potential to save. Fab fabulation no longer provides a mythical basis for the social cohesion and repressive morals of closed or traditional societies. Instead, it invents a dynamic counter mythology it works to envision possibilities of liberation in a still open and indeterminate future. To believe in such myths is to take them literally at face value, even without necessarily maintaining they're actually true. But that is what happens when we read narratives in general. For the purpose of the narrative, we believe in the truth of it, even though we know that it isn't literally true in the outside world. What matters with such fictions is the effect that they have on those who project them, as well as on those who see them and hear them. <clears throat> 
without such overt fictionalizing, it would scarcely be possible to push beyond the actual. It is only through fabulation that, as Alfred North Whitehead again puts it, without actually using the word, fact is confronted with alternatives. Okay, so an example of this kind of fabulation I, comes in the British science fiction writer China Mieville's novel Embassy Town from 2011, which is a novel deeply concerned with fabulation in this alternative sense, even though it does not use the word. The novel takes place on an alien planet, Arieka, that has been colonized by human beings, but that is home to an indigenous sentient species, the Arieki, also referred to by human beings as the hosts. Humans are the guests on the planet, uh, the indigenous species is the host. The Arieki speak a language that is purely literal, which they refer to as language, capital L, that is purely literal and referential. Each word of language meant just what it meant. Polysemy or ambiguity were impossible. This also means that it is impossible to tell a lie in the Ariake language. Every speech act necessarily corresponds totally and absolutely both to a thing or state of affairs to which it refers and to the intention behind its utterance. As a result, the novel's narrator says, for hosts, speech was thought it was as nonsensical to them that a speaker could say he could claim something it knew to be untrue as to me that I could believe something I knew to be untrue. Without language for things that didn't exist, they could hardly think them. They were vaguer by far than dreams. What imaginaries any of them could conjure at all must be misty and trapped in their heads. Without lies, without fiction, without so much as metaphor, the confrontation of fact with alternatives is impossible. One minor character in the novel considers language to be miraculous. He regards the host as noble savages, a race of pure truth tellers, and wishes to preserve them in this state. And you can see this as a kind of commentary on how many philosophers have idealized you know, absolute truth. And again, the impossibility of metaphor, slippage in language, fictions, and so on and so forth. But the, but the main protagonist, obvious, rejects this romantic primitivist idealization. Rather, she understands that the host's inability to deviate from things that they actually are is a severe handicap and wonders how they ever managed to survive the rigors of natural selection. Increasingly, she compares the host's inability to lie to her own inability to believe something I knew to be untrue, but where we just can't believe something which we don't believe, they can't even speak something which they don't believe. In fact, we believe things we know to be untrue quite often whenever we read novels or watch movies, etc. Literary theorists call this the suspension of disbelief. Without entertaining untruths in this way, we would be unable to read a novel like Embassy Town or indeed understand and enjoy any work of fiction whatsoever. The suspension of disbelief is what allows us to tell the truth with lies, that is to say, to fabulate. Embassy Town tells the story of how the Arieke move from language to ordinary language or from the literal to the metaphorical or from denotation to fabulation. There are two loopholes within the host's form of life that Abyss uses in order to break down their language altogether. One is simile. The Ariake can say that one thing is like another thing, more or less truthfully pointing out similarities and analogies between things or situations that are not identical. Of course, they can only make these analogies on the basis of things that actually exist or events that have actually happened. But once they get started making similes, they have a choice as to what they claim is like those actual things and happenings. Similarities come in various degrees. They're not guaranteed by any underlying absolute identi identity. So this is one sort of loophole in the absolute truth of the Arieki language. They have enough elbow room with similes. They can even say if they push themselves hard enough that two contradictory things are both like the same actual referential thing. Push just a bit further and they might even be able to move from simile to metaphor. Saying that the thing is another thing rather than just that a thing is like another thing. In human language, it's easy to move from love is like a rose to love is a rose. The host language categorically forbids this, but as Abbas says, similes start transgressions. The Arikiki are sufficiently allured and seduced by the prospect of violating their own rules. They even hold festivals of lies in which they get together and try to push themselves over the edge. Through this loophole, similes are a way out, a route from reference to signifying. It's again, a way of pushing against limits. There's a second loophole in the Ariake language, which has to do with physical gestures, most simply the act of pointing. 
When I point to something, I single it out, even though I do not explicitly say what it is. As obvious explains by pointing, I don't mean any specific one, but in general, that one, that one faces every way. It's flexible because it's empty, a universal equivalent. That always means, and not that other, too. Its initial single word was actually two, that and not that. And from that tiny and primal vocabulary, the motor of that antithesis spun out other concepts, me, you, others. In other words, the very act of pointing, of singling something out, um, hovers between being general, that is whatever I'm pointing to, and yet it's one specific thing that I am pointing to, but that does not mean that specific thing. There is nothing in the host language that corresponds to the word that or to any other demonstratives, but it turns out that the aria can do in fact single things out and pay attention to them by means of pointing to them. In this way, they continually use such gestures, both to make things clear to themselves and to communicate with others. It is just that since such pointing is not an explicit part of their language, they are not overtly aware that this is what they are doing. Abis realizes that pointing, just like making similes, might be a way to escape the literalism of the Ariake language. Any particular act of pointing is concrete and referential, but the gesture of pointing itself is abstract since it works the same way, regardless of just what is being pointed out. And since pointing makes the distinction, it separates what is pointed at from everything else. Thus, pointing once again allows the Ariyeki to push expression beyond the limits of their language and to move from referring to signifying or from literal to fabulative. The Ariyeki's entry into signif signifying language is difficult and painful. Abbas describes the process in terms that evoke both death and childbirth. They went through what sounded like agonies. They didn't all call out or scream, but all of them in different ways seemed as if they were dying pangs of something finishing and of birth. Now the Ariyeki were learning to speak and to think and it hurt. They were world sick as meanings yawned. Anything was anything now. Their minds were sudden merchants. Metaphor like money equalized the incommensurable. So metaphor here or figurative language or fabulation as opposed to literal statement is compared both to death, the agonies of death and to a new birth and to the way money works, as since you can use a certain amount of money to buy things indifferently, as Marx very strongly pointed out. So some people in the novel see this development in theological terms as a fall from the paradisal state of nature when thought and speech were one. But for the narrator of the novel, this transformation is a positive accomplishment. It means that finally the Ariyeki became themselves. Abbas's comparison of linguistic signification to capitalist commodity production and circulation is particularly telling. Metaphor, just like money, plays the roles of universal equivalent, making all things interchangeable. The Ariyeki, like everyone else living under capitalism, must now enter into a state of, to quote from Marx and Engels, everlasting uncertainty and agitation where all that is solid melts into air. Of course, there are other ways to describe this process as well. We can think both uh, in Western philosophy of Hegel's dialectic and with so serious dictum that in a language there are only differences, no positive terms. But, this, but the transformation or fight of literalism to fabulation is the whole point of the novel. He describes it on a micro level of metaphors and gestures and words and sentences, but it also takes place on a macro level as statements of fact give way to proliferating fabulations. In Abbas's world, the Areki had learned to, uh, to lie to insist on a truth. Fabulation takes falsity and turns it into a true aspiration. The aspiration itself is real, even if what it envisages as its goal is not actually accomplished. The very act of insisting on a certain might be, Abbas tells us, changed what was. By the end of the novel, the Areki are able for the first time to articulate their demands, not only among themselves, but also to the human settlers with whom they share their planet and beyond them to the colonizing power from another planet that claims ownership over the planet in the first place. So I take, even though the word fabulation is not used in Mievel's novel, I take the novel as, uh, as a fabulation about fabulation, you might say. Fabulation is unavoidably equivocal as universal equivalent can be exchanged for anything and everything. If it is like money, it is also like ideology. This is why it's so important to distinguish between dogmatic and speculative or op closed and open forms of fabulation. The very act of fabulation presumes a future that is open at least to some extent. In an entirely deterministic world where the future is settled as the past, fabulation would not even be possible. 
But fabulation is also a process without guarantees, precisely because it so capriciously departs from its starting point in what Whitehead calls the settled past. Fabulation can just as easily be deployed by a capitalist entrepreneur whose innovations are working relentlessly like rent adding to an investment in the wanted future, which is a quote from a business school professor. Uh, but it can also be exercised as, as Donna Haraway urges us to do for the worldly flourishing of multiple entities in the world becoming with one another. Okay, I think I will stop my stop my discussion there and just summarize. But though I've distinguished between extrapolation, speculation, and fabulation, these three practices really exist on a continuum. They're not radically distinct so much as they correspond to different levels of abstraction or different degrees of fictionalization. All three are way stations along the path of exploring futurity, given that futurity is in essence unknowable. Just as speculation picks up from extrapolation and pushes beyond its limits, so fabulation takes up the relay from speculation, inventing what we are no longer able to, when we are no longer able to plausibly speculate. But the aim in all cases is what Alfred North White had called sheer disclosure. But such disclosure is always limited. It represents as best, and I end with a quote from Whitehead, an imperfect penetration into our dim recognition of the world around, the world of facts, the world of possibility, the world as valued, the world as purposed. Okay, that is my lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was a very interesting and many different ideas come to my mind. So I will try to unfold them somehow so that we'll be able to build our discussion. The first idea that I have has to do with the um, extrapolation, speculation and fabulation sequence that you've constructed. I think it represents a certain dynamics of imagination. Imagination in this context is on the one hand a field, a tool for experimentation, a sort of a collider which can run at various speeds. And on the one hand, this experiment is so radical and so powerful that it can destroy the experimental device itself. And our imagination can be much broader than scientific fictional writing. And it seems to me that uh, uh, the author you mentioned is uh, thinking very interestingly on paralleling philosophy and science fiction, saying that uh, philosophy has its own fantastic experiment. We can even move further and say that the most radical form of science fiction is philosophy, since philosophy is intertwined into such a regimen of thought through such things as deconstruction, destruction, where we are thinking about the barrier between being and nothing. We are more and more, we're making our imagination run faster and faster and exclude the intellect and the mind in a strict Kantian sense. And a philosophy turns out uh, to be an experiment which uh, leaves the thoughts only in the imagination when nothing besides imagination remains. What do you think of philosophy as a radical form of fiction, of science fiction? Thank you for that comment. I certainly agree that there, I'm giving affinities between philosophy and science fiction. I'm also interested in seeing what the differences are, but um, obviously I, I mentioned scientific experiments and thought experiments, but obviously philosophy engages in thought experiments very often. And that's I, so I think a science fictional way of understanding philosophy is, is as good as a philosophical understanding of what science fiction is doing. There are parallels there. Sci American analytic philosophers often have these very limited thought experience, thought experiments, and 
they seem similar to science fiction, except sometimes they're more restricted in scope. Um, science fiction is more irresponsible in philosophy since it explores the consequences rather than spending so much time exploring the strict groundings of. Actually, in the book manuscript from which this is taken, I also write about a science fiction short story by science fiction writer Pat Cadigan, which is about the trolley problem in, in, in philosophy. So the trolley problem is this thought experiment where a trolley is going on the tracks, it's gonna kill some people. You can push it to another track and it'll kill one person instead of five people, but then you'll be responsible for killing one person. Whereas if you did nothing, you could say it wasn't my fault that the five people got killed. So it's a kind of dilemma. And there's actually a science fiction story where basically a, an artificial intelligence is given the the choice of this choice and the artificial intelligence basically responds that having the travel the trolley shouldn't be going in the first place is an artificial setup and that actually i mean in the story this it's it's linked to american drones which attack alleged terrorists in afghanistan and the the ai eventually kills the American soldiers to prevent their drones from killing a much larger number of Afghanis. And the US military is very upset about this, but the um, AI argues that it's ethically the right thing to do, or it's the lesser evil. So they're very, so I mean, what I mean is that a science fiction story which deals with this philosophical problem imagines it in a very different way from how the philosophers themselves who've written copies, they like scores of philosophers who've written articles about this problem. So you can see both the parallelism and the difference in doing that. The trouble is, you know, good science fiction does this really well and a lot of science fiction is mediocre and doesn't do it well. And the same thing in philosophy, there are really inventive philosophy thought experiments and less, and kind of less interesting or more overly narrow ones. Thank you. In this regard, you also spoke about the word weird um, when you were talking about science fiction and types of science fiction. Uh, I'm thinking about the term by Shklovsky, estrangement, uh, which is interestingly showing uh, the uh, similarities between the philosophic thought and science fiction writing and um, imagination because estrangement is a procedure that uh, kicks you out of the automatic order of uh, meanings and the rupture happens um, the um, meaning is destroyed and you stop seeing the um, links where they usually seen estrangement allows to fantasize about the already existing the issue is not only about imagining things that can exist in the future but uh, some things that do exist today but we unexpectedly find some absolutely different connections and this disrupts our order of possibility and order of existence in the same context we can also remember um, Sergei Korokhin, a Russian um, um, author who introduced the term of um, microphasy, appealing simultaneously to truck structuralist school and to psychopathology. It was the process of uh, controlled madness of the imagination thanks to which we can um, resist because the function of imagination an important function is related to resistance in, to the policy which is incorporated into every act of imagination i know that you have certain ideas about the phoenix of capitalism the limitations of the possible and also uh, phrased by Frederick Jameson that it is easier to imagine the apocalypse rather than the end of capitalism. Perhaps we could touch upon the question of the politics of imagination. 
Thank you for that. Um, there's, there, there, there's a lot there and I'll say about several of them. One is um, the Shropsky's term of estrangement, which actually does get into science fiction criticism. Darko Suvin, who's still the most influential theorist of science fiction in the English language, precisely describes, as I mentioned at the beginning of my, my talk, science fiction is a literature of cognitive estrangement. And by estrangement, he is thinking of the Russian formalists and Shklovsky, though he's also thinking of Bertolt Brecht. But um, this plays an important part in the way that this works. The term weird in English and as weird fiction is actually from the early 20th century, it was, it was Weird Tales was a, was a magazine which published stories by H.P. Lovecraft and others which involved monsters and otherworldly, you know, de deadly horrors and so on. But the term has been revived in recent years. Both China Mievo, whose novel Embassy Town I was talking about, and Jeff Vandermeer, an American writer whose um, book Annihilation, among others, is a, is, has had a major impact, is are they both refer to what they're doing as the new weird. And they're talking about weird fiction, precisely as that which you know, sort of suggests that the ordinary processes of cause and effect and the way things work in, cons in consensus reality are, are not, do not really work and strange things happen. It's unclear to me to what the really, I mean, when in the early 20th century, when American pulp writers referred to weird fiction, I don't think they knew about Shklovsky, but I think the two terms definitely have an inter interpenetration. So that's what I'd answer for that. In terms of imagining alternatives, I mean, I think, you know, politically, again, some there's some, it, I mean, if you look at it, the history of Anglo-American science fiction, it's been very mixed politically. There've been right-wing and left-wing science fiction writers, um, writers in the, in the mid 20th century who had this whole idea of a myth of scientific and technological progress and who associated this with sort of basic American values. But you also had left-wing, left-leaning science fiction writers who opposed, who opposed that and tried to think the future in more politically different terms. In recent years in the Anglo-American sphere, there've been more writings by, by women, by people of color, by gay and lesbian people, which have opened up alternative possibilities to the very kind of straight white heteronormative world of mid 20th century science fiction writers. But I think politically, obviously, if you're imagining alternatives, there's no guarantee. I mean, you have fascistic science fiction as well as communistic science fiction as well as all other, all other kinds. I mean, so the very fact that you're fabulating doesn't mean that it's automatically uh, one thing politically. That's why I mentioned the difference between open and closed forms of fabulation, which is something originated by Bergson, though without direct political consequence, and then taken up by Deleuze and given more of a political, a political twist. I would say that radical change is not possible without some form of imaginative expression, which includes what I'm calling fabulation. But obviously, this can be used for other, for other ends. And also, again, a lot of science fiction is dystopian. It's just showing horrific results of current trends. Um, but you know that you can't say that somebody um, doesn't like, you know, if somebody doesn't like um, these trends, somebody else might might like them. I recently heard, this is not exactly science fiction, but in the movie, in Steven Spielberg's movie, Jaws, you have one of the bad guys in the movie is the mayor of the town who tries to get people to go back into the water, even though there's sharks there and it's dangerous because it's good for business if people are swimming more. Um, Boris Johnson, the prime minister of the United Kingdom has actually said that he, that he regards the mayor of the, the town in Jaws as his hero and as somebody who's doing the right thing, even though the movie portrays him as doing the wrong thing. So, you know, you can't control things like that. Thank you. Now I was talking about imagination as a kind of radical politics, politics that can set themselves, set itself free from any ideology. When we're talking about choosing a political direction, 
fabulation is more than this, it can be a radical breakup with the previous uh, senses and a resistance to any kind of uh, imposing, imposition of uh, senses and meanings. Uh, imagination has its own rules and uh, regardless of how fiction works, science fiction works through philosophy or through literature, it becomes a kind of radical politics that is independent of itself. Yeah, yes, I, I would agree with that entirely. But the fact is that that is why it, it's not a political statement and it's something which can then be recaptured for political reasons. I mean, certain 20th century modern, <clears throat> excuse me, certain 20th century modern writers, um, say like Georges Bataille in France, are inspiring because they critique any possible political order. But that sort of means you couldn't actually have a society along the lines that Bataille might have imagined. However, his objection to the limits of any other, of any particular social situation is itself something which can maybe inspire us to push for things to be different. Bataille himself was concerned with this because he wrote, among other things, about how this was hopefully different from fascism, which he saw as a way of recuperating the same kind of energies he was talking about for sinister and evil ends. So there's no, I mean, I think there's no guarantee, there's no poss <clears throat> possible thing you cannot <clears throat> prescribe that imagination, imaginative, imagination in various forms is just, is automatically going to serve some political goal, much as historical, many political regimes have tried to make it, but I want to say that it allows possibility for good changes, even though it is not programmatic and cannot be totally made programmatic. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, спасибо. Yes, thank you. And now I'm bringing in a question from our audience that they send in through the broadcast chat. The question from our listener, Alexander Sushinsky. He says, thank you for your lecture. You probably remember Arthur Clarke's story, Nine Billion Names of God. And it covers this uh, bridge between present and the past. And we know that Lacan was skeptical towards truth. You can't marry truth. Now I'm working on a PhD and I'd like to ask you, currently in the post-truth uh, world, the possibility of a fake is connected to the non-realized future when history uh, when present is disclosed we rewrite the past and we have a similar uh, element in plutarch's story of solon and croesus what do you think about this link between past and present um <clears throat> i think obviously um again part of this and this relates to the previous comments also that <clears throat> Fictioning or fabulation, or whatever you want to call it, cannot be guaranteed to be a good thing. We see this in contemporary politics with all kinds of very bizarre fictional things people believe and often have very horrifying effects. But um, and, okay, I'm not sure I'm getting your question exactly. In terms of the past, um, the past is, I mean, you can lie, people can lie about the past, obviously, and some of these lies can spread. But um, I think that, I think there's an asymmetry between past and future because you cannot well you cannot really change the past it's what Whitehead calls it settled fact what you can do is take different resources from it and interpret it in different ways and pull out different strands from it everything in the past is kind of there for us to deal with and we can't just un ignore it and uproot it because it is so importantly in constituting what we are today but um, Fabulation or projecting futurities obviously communicates with and depends upon pastness or potentialities that existed. Um, so, I mean, in science fiction, this is done in various ways. Um, one is imagining an alternative past. There's a great American science fiction novel, Fire on the Mountain by Terry Bisson, which imagines an alternative history in which in in, in the United States in 1860, a slave rebellion was successful. So instead of the Civil War, 
you have a largely black republic controlling the south or being controlling the south and you have uh, and thinking through what that is something that could have happened but didn't and there's another science fiction book by ward I, by ward more i'm blanking the title but which is again this one assumes that the south actually won the american civil war and became independent and it, both novels explore racism and anti-racism based on rewriting what actually happened in the past, but they're both drawing on potentialities from the past in order to think about different presents and futures. So I don't know, I mean, I don't have, here's the criterion that can get rid of fake news and, and, and so on in our present media situation. But um, it doesn't work when people, I mean, in the United States, we've seen, you know, all these, I guess I have to say the fabulations of supporters of Donald Trump and people believe what seem to me to be incredibly bizarre things, but it doesn't work to oppose those by saying, well, here's rationality, here's fact, because that misses the, the emotional strength of the discourse. You, you need counter fabulations to the fabulations being being circulated. Um, you know, I could talk at much greater length about that, but that's just my general sense of it. I hope that answered the question reasonably. Yes, thank you. We have another similar question about the relationship between reality and fiction and science fiction. But what I would like to say here to this particular subject is that this proportion, this rate of fiction to reality or fictitiousness and materiality is uh, today touched by such concepts as meme in Richard Dawkins, our hyperstition mm -hmm. developed by Langer and the London philosophical school. This tradition, this circle, however we call it. In fact, I think that this problem is deeply rooted in this very Marxist subject of ideality, of idealness. And this was very well developed by a Soviet philosopher called Evald Ilyenko. In his work, he shows that the ideal is a kind of a parasite. Everything developed by human thought is ideal because it's a parasitic mechanism that comes to world with zero reality to it. An idea is something that makes itself existing. It creates itself. It can integrate into technological culture or it can create itself through spread like religion, like Christianity, through expanding its coverage. But it can also become material, become engendered in a building in a church, in a technology. So in general, science fiction is a kind of a technology of governing this process of materialization. And that's why we're asking about science fiction as politics, science fiction as resistance, because here it competes with political theory, among others. That's mm -hmm. what I wanted to add here. Yes. that makes a lot of a lot of sense to me um it's but it's also linked to the way that science fictional imaginaries or ideals enter other realms of discourse um you know when the united states started this kind of a new branch of the military which deal with outer space it's it was rightly ridiculed by many people because it seems to be they've seen some episodes of Star Wars, you know, they watched Star Wars for a while and say, okay, you're gonna have these cool uniforms and people traveling through outer space. And, and so it's sort of like I certain fictions are taken in literally in, in such a way that they create a feedback effect. So I everything that you could say about hyperstition or about or, or about the power of ideals which become embodied in institutions and in materialities is, is, is true. Um, what I would say on the behalf of science fiction is that you can't, it is, it is impossible to counter that by insisting like certain 
people do that oh, only on scientific fact that only on what you know rationality and only on, on on what you know is empirically verifiable because human desires and fantasies always go beyond this so it's a question of uh, you know opposing fantasies and fantastic constructions with other fantasies and fantastic constructions you there's no guarantee you can step back and say well this is i mean there are you know, this is an argument which goes on certainly in Anglo-American thought a lot. And I assume, I mean, I don't know enough about what the history of Russian thought or about what's happening in Russian society today, but it's it's obviously a similar situation. So I would agree with what you're saying. And I mean, this, this also has to do with why I talk about finance, because if you have the hyperstition, they think that fictions which are systematically circulated become their own truth. You also have the way in which if by being captured in financial instruments and being paid for it in effect in advance and priced in advance. You also have always, there, there are all these ways of controlling the future. And we want to say that ways of controlling the future are oppressive and we want to break free of them. At the same time, it's impossible not to want to control the future to some extent. And so on one hand, I'm saying these are insidious projects of trying to control the future, which shouldn't, which shouldn't be done. On the other hand, I'm saying, we cannot control the future, but we also cannot not control the future, not try to control the future. So let's try to find better ways of trying to control it, even though they won't totally succeed. Thank you. It is very good that you also reminded us of the parallels between the intellectual and financial speculation. I think this is a relevant issue. As we can say that Kant, when he uh, was uh, denouncing the speculative program of the metaphysics and the speculative function of the mind, yeah, to a certain extent, this can be paralleled with what was going on when you were talking about the 2008 um, recession. Kant is an intellectual financist uh, who uh, opened this uh, bubble which the metaphysics was creating for many centuries by building its intellectual uh, system uh, of ideas that are not directly related to experience. And in this regard, Marxism is also a continuation of this Kantian criticism. In, um, it sees this double movement behind Kantian movement, the economical and the intellectual. Mm -hmm. Yes, what, that, that makes sense to me. I think maybe we need a theory that multiplies the different levels and sees how complexly they're intertwined. I know in Marxist theory, there's been a lot of dispute about it to what's the relation between base and superstructure or between material conditions and their ideological reflections. And it's obviously very complicated and not as simplistic as at least some parts of Marxist tradition tried to make it out to be. But um, I mean, I don't, I don't have any final ans answer to this. I think this is the area which we should try to be as conscious of as possible because it's what we can explore. And in particular, so I'm interested in science fiction. I'm not saying it's the only mode, but it's one mode of conducting these, these explorations. And that, that's basically what I have to say about that. Thank you. We have one more question from the audience. Roman is asking the question. Today, it is very popular to divide science fiction into hard, scientific, and soft, more humanitarian. But is there a real difference in its approaches to building worlds and uh, stories between these two genres? Is there a fundamental difference? Thanks, that's a great question. Again, um, obviously there are certain empirical dis distinctions which are being lo looked at there, um, but I don't think that is, I don't think it's a totally absolute distinction. 
and there are always transgressions on one side or another. One way to describe it, Ursula, Le, the American science fiction and fantasy writer Ursula Le Guin sort of said that science, hard science fiction deals with physical science and so, so-called soft science fiction deals with human sciences or with things like that. So if you're dealing with anthropology or sociology, you'll be writing so-called soft science fiction. If you're dealing with physics and quantum mechanics and relativity, then you'll be dealing with hard science fiction. But again, it's it's not always possible to make to isolate those things too completely. So I think there's a spectrum, there's a there's a degree of different different approaches, but um, if the soft science fiction risks total implausibility or impossibility, then the hard science fiction risks, you know, basically having no human interest or anything like that. So I don't think, so in other words, I recognize the distinction. I think it's not absolute. I think there are ways of negotiating it. And I try to see more of a multiple positions along a continuum. Um, thank you. Um, while listening to you, I also came up with one question we could also look at here is the question of the medium of science fiction. Um, or at least I uh, didn't catch uh, whether you made a delineation. Well, as many of your examples were taken from the literature, but you didn't uh, uh, delineate between literature, cinema, and, uh, for instance, video games, because mm -hmm. this is a very, it's a very interesting question. Can science fiction exist in other media besides literature? There is a position by philosopher Alexander Vitushinsky, for instance, when he speaks about the death of imagination, about the phenomena of video games, has destroyed the tool which literature had because we needed to imagine while reading but when we can play a video game we our extended imagination is already incorporated in the material product into the video game and intellectual imagination purely intellectual imagination ceases to work. Uh, do you think uh, that science fiction and fantasy can survive um, beyond literature and writing? And can it transmedially be transferred into cinema and video games? And what do you think about this uh, idea of the death of the imagination? Um, that That's an important question. And it's one which I didn't explicitly deal with, but I, I do. I'm doing. I'm interested in different media forms. Actually, I, as a professor, I teach film studies rather than literature studies. But it's true that in science fiction, I'm mostly working with literature. I think. Well, there's several ways to put this. One is that it's a matter of money. Um, written science fiction, at least in the English-speaking word world, often has bigger range than science fiction movies do, precisely because it's so much low, lower budget. And when you're worried about millions of dollars, it's much harder. There'll be much more control over not making it too weird because it'll alienate too many people. Whereas if you're writing a novel, that's a relatively still low budget thing. And as a result, there's, I find empirically that there's much more wider range of imagination in written science fiction than in other visual or audiovisual science fiction. Okay, that's part thing. But of course, there's also a question of invention through forms. And obviously, as I'm arguing, written science fiction generally retains the conventions of naturalistic, 19th century naturalistic fiction, even though it's depicting imagined alternative worlds. Um, formal, in, formal innovation, I think, has to go through more recent media forms. And I'm very interested in audiovisual media and, and things they do formally. One way to put this, it's, it's sort of a joke because it's a little reductive, but it says, I, the two things I've been mostly writing about in my own scholarly work in recent years are one, science fiction, and two, music videos. And this is, I know, too reductive, so it's partly a joke, but it's partly true, is that I read the science fiction for the content, and I analyze the music videos for the form. So science fiction is conservative formally, but has 
radical content, you might say, and music videos are conservative in terms of content. The same messages that pop music's gone for, for 150 years, but it's formally often very adventurous and innovative. So I do think imagination can work in different forms. There are differences. I mean, one difference, as I said, has to do with economics and budget. Certain ideas are not going to be expressed if there's a lot of money involved in what in the course of movies today. So science fiction movies, especially high budget ones, will tend to be more normative and conservative than science fiction writing often is. The uh, third, the, the other thing mentioned in the question was video games. And I have to confess, I'm fascinated by the knowing more about science fiction constructions of video games, but they're unavailable to me because I'm not a gamer. I'm just, I'm maybe too old. I'm just, I never didn't really grow up with it. I just cannot play the video games very well. So I read articles about it or, I mean, this will seem funny, but I some, sometimes they have novelizations of video games. So they'll hire a science fiction writer to write a novel, which is based on the universe of the video game. And I'll, sometimes I will actually read those just to get an idea of what's being talked about, but obviously it's not the same. So I don't think that the shift, which were undergone for over a century from linear printed writing to audiovisual forms is a death of thought. I think we have to seek out the way it works in different ways. So these will have to do with form as well as content. And they may not be immediately apparent because, you know, again, exploration of alternatives is harder to do when more money's at stake, when, when the people buying the money want something more normative to be created. So, I mean, I don't, so again, I'm open to that. I don't think it's the death of imagination that we have to return to literature. The reasons why I, for science fiction I focus most on literature, but I think these other forms definitely need extrapolation and are in fact doing interesting things which need to be brought out. Thank you. I think that death of imagination here is not meant negatively, but rather it's about the transformation of imagination mm. into a material and um, a very um, um, uh, it is it is related to game design and other things the death in a sense that can be um, measured by human when a human dies the imagination also dies i think here it is rather about moving to something positive and inspired by the um, scientific fiction understanding of um, reality because science fiction is also killing imagination to a certain extent it makes it just a tool a method uh, what you described today is a structure of some fundamental method of managing um, imagination so it's not just intuition or enlightenment in this regard science fiction is not literature in the sense of the critical classical literature is some insight uh, that the author receives it's rather technology something that is bigger than uh, just uh, writing of literature mm. that makes sense to me though i don't know the writings you're referring to but again um i think the question of modes and technologies is an important one, obviously, especially in our society today. And I just think that that's more material that needs to be explored. I'm not sure I'm the one capable of exploring that for the reasons I already said. Uh, yes, well, we are just discussing these issues. I think they are also important. There is such a short commentary and question from Sergei, from our audience as well, about the relationships of uh, the futurity and ontology. Oh. So um, futurity and ontology are the terms that the author of the question used. Okay, yeah, that's, I, I mean, that's a good question. Um, ontology, which was a term invented by Jacques Derrida, gets brought into the discourse of thinking about popular forms by 
Mark Fisher, the late Mark Fisher wrote about hauntology and music. Um, I think, that, and I haven't used the term hauntology, but I do kind of think that, you know, not only the past, but the future kind of haunt us. Um, Derrida is pointing to a kind of form of non-presence. Um, the fact that, I mean, again, it's, it's a general sense, it's very easy to think, and I think politicians often want to think the past is old and is old and gone. It doesn't mean anything anymore. It's dead. Um, the American novelist William Faulkner said, "The past isn't isn't dead. It isn't even past," <clears throat> meaning that it still informs and haunts us in various ways. So, um, in Derrida's and Mark Fisher's use, they this kind of pre continuing existence of the past is related to a kind of science fictional imagination because we have um, one way to think of science fiction, this is something from the American critic Frederick Jameson, is um, that science fiction goes back to the past and gives us the present as the past of a different future. So if things had gone differently, then our present would be different and that can be seen retrospectively in terms of, of science fiction. So I, I don't think that's that far from Derrida's sense that these past potentialities, even if they weren't realized, still haunt us and still um, offer us potentialities. Um, what I'm interested in in particular is thinking about whether the same logic that applies to the past applies to the future. I think um, all these figures in very different ways, including people like Derrida and people like Deleuze in France and people like Whitehead, and certain strands of Marxist thought sort of will all say in their own different ways that we cannot just isolate the present, the things are present as an instant, then the now is totally separate from what comes before and comes after. If you reject that kind of radical atomism where the present is completely disconnected from anything either before or after, then you want to seriously think about things like ontology, about how sort of departed things still lurk and linger. Um, my quest, my philosophical question which I'm not sure I've worked out to my satisfaction is about how the how talking about the future and talking about the past, both how they're related, but how they're different. Um, it's not just that they're both references. They are both references, as Terry Dow would say, beyond the illusion of presence of the now, but the references or might work in different ways. I'm interested in thinking about how futurity is related to but different from ontology because the mode of existence of the past in relation to the present and of the future in relation to the present are not symmetrical with each other. Time, I mean, it's a big thing, which, you know, all the, I don't know enough physics to know about all the, I value all the things physicists say about time, but one of the big problems for physicists today is that um, physics equations sort of imply inequality of both directions of time, whereas experience doesn't. The, the future is not, and the past are not interchangeable or mirrors of each other. And, it, you know, there are various reasons physicists give to explain this, but I mean, it's a, it's a basic tension between the idea that, say, equations of physical reality are time independent and that temporality has a direction. So, I mean, that's, um, you know, if any philosopher actually solved all that, they'd be like one of the greatest thinkers of the age, but so I don't have any solution, but that seems to be where the question I'd locate and where I'd answer what you asked about ontology. Thank you. I think the question of this haunting specter, this ghost, uh, touches upon interesting subjects, including things that we have already discussed with ideas and memes and their materialization, because it's interesting to ask whether an ideology, an ideology can have a ghost. For example, talking about capitalism, is there a specter of capitalism? Because from the point of view of econ economy of ideas, a ghost is an idea that it keeps being crossed out from the capitalism of ideas. It is a devalued idea, an idea that is uh, thrown out of the economy of ideas. Mm -hmm. It's something that Alain Bodhi calls an event. A ghost is an event because it destroys 
how to put it, destroys all the existing infrastructure, infrastructure of manufacturing and speculating and the modes of functioning of imagination. It's a good question. What makes a ghost a ghost, a specter a specter? Is it its liminal location or is it what we can call, let's say, a revelation, a revelation of an event, mm. some kind of uh, self-sufficient existence of the event as it is, independent of the subject? Hmm. That's a difficult question and one to which I have no answer. I just think a lot of philosophers of the 20th and 21st century are actually dealing with that issue. You quoted Badiou and the whole way he's talking about it's the way an event is not part of the situation. That's why it can destroy and rupture and change the situation. Um, when you go into Derrida with ontology, it's a little different because Again, maybe he has a different notion of event or he's referring more to the past, or I mean, Derrida is explicitly in that book, Spectres of Marx, referring to the Communist Manifesto, and which is translated in English and, and in French as a specter is haunting Europe, or so, which is, um, so there's a kind of, I mean, event, and then if you have somebody like Deleuze defines events in a very different way than Badiou does, part of the difference or dispute between the two of them. And I would also add in French philosophy, Emmanuel Levinas, who relates events to the incipients of the other, who again disrupts the totality and structure of what centered upon yourself that you take for granted. So, I mean, I don't, I don't want to, I'm, I would say I'm not a philosopher because I do not give my own answer to this question. I explore, I think what science fiction does and what I do as a critic is to explore these different potential ways of thinking about potentiality and seeing them in tension with each other and not saying, oh, this one is the answer. Um, partly as an, um, when I say I'm not a philosopher, it's that I don't have the kind of rigorous arguments that philosophers have even when they totally disagree with each other about what is the answer. I think, I think thinking those in terms of fictionality and in terms of alternatives and in terms of just realizing that from all these very different philosophical points of view, the sense of closure and self-evident of the present instant is always being ruptured in one way or another. And for me, that's what the important thing is. Thank you. One more question from Alexander Stushinsky, who has already asked us one question today. He was asking us about Lacan and Arthur Clarke. And now his second question is about Christianity. When Christianity started as a project, it looked into future, but modernity canceled this project. Is there a teleology in our contemporary outlook of the future? Um, that's, that's a great question. And again, I will evade rather than saying, here's the answer. Um, I am trying, what I'm trying to do in talking about science fiction in this way is to try to think of futurity without teleology, even though it's very hard in actual discourse for us to get away from some sense of teleology, whether positive, everything's getting better and better or negative, everything's kind of leading to catastrophe and destruction. Um, I want to think about the future as radically open, um, but that also doesn't mean that anything, I mean, it's not as, I'm not a surrealist either in the sense that anything could happen for no reason at all. Okay, so the, so the question of, can we think about continuity across time without thinking of teleology? It's very difficult to, but I think that is the project I would want to have. In terms of how it's worked out historically, you can talk about, as the question did about Christianity. I mean, Christianity is originally eschatological. It, it sees, I mean, the book of Revelations was written in the expectation that, you know, the next 50 years, the Roman Empire would be collapsed and the reign of Christ on earth would come to pass. And Christianity is had to deal with, for thousands of years with now, with the failure of that to happen. And that may be true also of other teleologies, of any Hegelian or Marxist form of teleology. Um, why aren't we why haven't we achieved socialism yet if you're an orthodox Marxist? Um, so um, my effort is to try to think of these things without teleology. Think that 
things are not, you know, predestined or under control. There's no teleology which has to happen. It's radically uncertain, um, but to but to realize also, but to realize the danger of you know trying to predict futurity makes it very hard to not set up a, a teleology. I mean, in terms of Marxism, I think that Marx's analysis of how capitalism works remain very cogent, but obviously his prediction of what the future would be is didn't work. And I mean, either either in America or in Russia, obviously, for different reasons. But so again, I'm trying to hold that open, though I realize it's difficult to hold it open. Thank you. It's an interesting point about this very uh, brittle limit between, brittle border between the past and the future. And the figure of a ghost brings the past into the future. And uh, it creates a rupture in our everyday understanding of time, modern European treatment of time as a sequence, as a direct line, mm -hmm. straight line from the past to the future, from the beginning to the end. Because it's very hard to imagine time without a radical situation, outside of a situation. We can talk about the phenomenon of contemporarity uh, because contemporaneity the contemporary is the assemblage of time out of various uh, temporalities. It is a kind of a geological stratigraphy of times layered upon each other. On the other hand, when we look, for example, at environmental processes, uh, if we look at sinkholes that can appear in any kind of geological structures, as we can see in many Russian towns and cities, the situation of a layer of earth being broken down with several orders clashing, it is a contemporary whose geology is not layered. It's an ecology of time that works through mixing and not layering. That's why we can talk about these troubling times, about a mixture, about a mesh, It's the situation of the contemporary that is contemporary to us, and it is turned on its head, becomes a mix of past, present, and future that is very hard to order into this progressive line. Yes. Um, no, I, I like what you just said. I think there. It's often opposed between the Western post enlightenment progression, time as a linear progression to a teleology, and versus, say, traditional or indigenous societies which have a cyclical version of time. But what you're suggesting, and which I think is correct, is that for us now, we can't accept either of those mo models. So I like the idea of these different layers which emerge. And, you know, because of global warming, we are seeing these in northern regions. You know, when you mention the sinkholes, um, there are different strata of pastness which haunt in different ways or which have different relevances or can be reactivated in different ways. Um, and I, so that's certainly how we have to see the past in relation to the present. The question how we see the future in relation to the present is, I think, even more complicated. And I don't have a good answer, but um, I want to think that future and past are, as I said, are not symmetrical with each other. But if we have this non home we have to we have to understand a non homogeneous temporality, but it still is marked by the arrow of time and the difference between pastness and futurity. And again, I don't have any philosophical answer. My hope and feeling is that certain science fiction is one of the modes in which we are maybe given new tools to think this. That won't necessarily mean every science fiction work does it very well, but some do. And it's one of the modes, there are others in which we can sort of contemplate that those issues. Thank you very much. I think we're running out of time.
uh, talking about time, this resource allocated to us and uh, our energy for such a an intense discussion. And that's why I would like to start wrapping up. I'd like to thank you, Stephen, for this brilliant lecture and I think very fruitful discussion. I'd like to thank all the listeners for their feedback and their interesting questions that we tried to uh, introduce into the dramaturgy. And develop this stage act in a way to обучение, the school for giving us the opportunity to have the discussion. This cycle of meetings continues. It will run until November the 9th, where we will have a performance or a statement by Marina Abramovich. And now it's time for us to say goodbye to our listeners. Uh, wish everybody good luck. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. It was it was great.